Uh, James's internet connection is probably being hogged up. With- Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle here on episode 365, recorded August 20th, 2018. I don't really know what we're going to... I think we're going to maybe talk racism, maybe talk socio, sociopathic behavior. I don't know. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with James Neese, so I figured I'd have it with uh, in, in public. What's the point of talking to someone if you can't use it on air, right? That's my motto. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the program. We're off to a banner start. Harry, uh, Harry has been talking over the introduction, uh, so I had to mute him. Harry, how are you doing? Uh, Let me- I don't even know because you didn't like give no warning that we started recording. I didn't hear no audio cue in my headset. Um, you you didn't hear me go. All right, let's get this started, and then I started. Pl- I I said multiple times. Yeah, but I didn't hear any audio cue in my headset. Usually there's an audio noise, right? That was like, oh, the intro has started. Huh. So you didn't hear the music at all? Nope. Oh, that's weird. At all. Yeah. That's how it goes. Uh, also with us is, <laughs> is James Nice. James, how are you doing? I'm all right. I was just showing people how my, my, my computer, screen, computer speed right now is 420.69. 69 gigahertz. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah, but your your internet is shit. Like all that we're, we've been talking, and you just start going. It's like you're oh, on. Oh a- no! It, it, I have this in the web browser, so apparently when I tab out somewhere else, it goes to shit. Oh, okay. Well, try to avoid that, especially you know when you're making the brilliant points that you're making. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, just, I, won't, I won't. Go ahead. Yeah, I won't. I won't. I won't go ship post while we're doing that because I'm trying to ship post do this at the same time. As soon as you swap the tab, it's like let me just kill this microphone let it beat you um you were explaining to me in the uh so we have a bonus section of every episode while we're kind of setting up we chit chat and uh, you get to hear james parenting so that's fun and then mm. you also get to uh get a tour of some harem guild video game where he <laughs> where <laughs> he has he makes internet love to uh to young waifus I got all 12 achievements, dude. All 12. (laughs) Is that like an STD or what? No, you got to like, there are certain parameters you got to do. Like, you you know, you might, it's like some of them are pretty easy. It's like, oh, just bang her. She doesn't have enough money, right? But then some of them are like, I need to slay a dragon. And then when I kill the dragon and I got to go on a quest to turn this like pissed off paladin and be like, she's like, oh, wait. Jameson, you're the best. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. am. What up? <laughs> <laughs> niece, you were on, you came on and explained 4chan to us a while back. Like, give us a recap of your your deep, dark world on the internet, your origins, your relation to 4chan, all that stuff. Just give them some background before we get started on this conversation. Uh, yeah, so... Harry and I, Harry and I, have been on the internet for like a long, long time, right? So unlike Harry, who was like, "I don't get on the internet and I want to learn stuff," I got on the internet to shit post on like BBS boards and uh, a couple of like web forums back in like IRC chat, really. So there used to be like before, you know, AIM, MSN, ICQ. There used to be like you know IRC chat. So a lot of like shit posting happened there. Mostly it was like people that play Diablo. Right or people played StarCraft, and 4chan came around and like, hey, there's a forum you could you know you could check out anime titties. And we were posting a bunch of fucking like Diablo cheats and shit, so we'd come <laughs> here and play. You know, then then it sort of evolved into uh, what it is today. But originally, it could be like a moderator or a janitor. 
which is just cleaning up threads. So we're cleaning up threads and basically started with IRC, then moved over to like a bunch of uh, web forms, post farm, FOH guild forums and 4chan. Yeah. All right. So we, we've been talking a little bit about this. Sh Go ahead, Harry. Do you know what an IRC is? Can you, uh, James, you want to explain what IRC is? Chris That's doesn't like know what IRC is. little chat thing. He doesn't know what IRC is. Yeah, it's a chat bot. Mm. It's where you go, and you, 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 you connect via an IP address to other users, and you steal their information, and it's like, hey, click this link, and then you make them into a botnet, and then you find somebody you don't like, and you send your botnet out to like basically DDoS their website, and then you send them like, you know, pictures of your dick and shit, you know, when you have to fix it to repair it. It's like, oh, click this link, I'll fix it. Oh, it's your dick, lemon party. Oh, goatsy. <laughs> Why would you do that? Why, why would you do that to somebody? Good old ghost. Uh, yeah. It's, it is, it's, hmm? it's the wild it's the wild west. Back in like the nineties is the wild west. Yeah, true. It's the wild wild west. So as we've kind of been talking a little bit about this, uh the El Paso shooter and uh, I, I don't know. I was I was involved. There's this state legislator here in Indiana that everybody thinks is super libertarian. Oh, he agrees with us on 80 percent of stuff. And this guy is just a MAGA MAGA Trump guy. And, you know, we we uh, in terms of issues, it may look like we agree with the guy on a lot of different things, but uh, we certainly don't. And he's in terms of how we actually approach things, the guy's former military and just has like this view on people. He treats everybody like he was treated in boot camp and you're, it's all very black and white and you're either good or bad. You're right. Or, he just has like that mentality of somebody that is, I don't know. I, I, I had praised him effusively on this podcast called married with children a while back for being an independent thinker. But after a couple interactions with him and talking to the, the local libertarians in his area and a few other people who work around the government stuff, because this guy's like really pushing pot legalization and, uh, you know, during the immigration stuff, he just I said some really sociopathic things like really didn't care that these brown kids were all crapping in their diapers and it's their fault. It's very uncaring and brutal. Um, and then we had a conversation. Uh, then he just posted this black kid basically had admitted to a bunch of rapes. And he put a picture of like an old Western noose or three up. And basically everybody connected the dots and was like, oh, you're saying you're out, you're, out, you're inside things outside now, buddy. And he just didn't back down. He doubled down and then some domestic violence victims started finding posts that he made that were super misogynistic. And I'm just like, what is wrong with this guy? <laughs> like he, he kind of reminds me, uh, there's a strain of libertarians or libertarian leaning people, or they at least look like they're libertarian because they talk about natural rights. They talk about a lot of stuff and they're very unempathetic. And it reminded me of the Jeffrey Tucker article in 2014, early in 2014, he wrote this article called, Against Libertarian Brutalism, which you should read. It's really good, and I'll put it in the show notes. And he essentially kind of talks about how there's two versions of libertarianism. Or there, there's two versions of libertarians. Uh, you know, let me just read a, a couple portions of this. Um, because I think this article, when it came out, it was super controversial. Oh, well, and he was talking about the Chris Cantwells of the world. And then surprise, surprise, three years later, Cantwell's marching in Charlottesville. And Jeffrey Tucker just drops the mic and is like, see, I told you so. Uh, and it's always kind of existed within libertarian worlds and libertarian thinking. And, you know, here at We Are Libertarians, most of us subscribe to the idea that you start with the idea that human beings are worth value regardless of their race, religion, color, creed, political ideology. They're deserving of dignity. They're deserving of respect. They're deserving of rights. And we try to take an empathetic approach to a lot of different issues. And um, as he talked about in this 2014 um, article, the humanitarians, uh, so let me just start from the beginning. Um, why should we favor human liberty over a social order ruled by power? And providing the answer, I would suggest that libertarians can generally be divided into two camps, humanitarians and brutalists. The humanitarians are drawn to reasons such as the following. 
Liberty allows peaceful human cooperation. It inspires the creative service of others. It keeps violence at bay. It allows for capital formation and prosperity. It protects human rights against all invasion. It allows human associations of all sorts to flourish on their own terms. It socializes people with rewards towards getting along rather than tearing each other apart and leads to a world in which people are valued in, as ends in themselves rather than fodder in the central plan. <coughs> and he goes on to um, say, excuse me, <coughs> there is a segment of the population, self-described libertarians, described here as brutalists, who find all, above, all of the above rather broad, boring, and excessively humanitarian. To them, what's impressive about liberty is that it allows people to assert their individual preferences, to form homogenous tribes, to work out their biases in action, to ostracize people based on politically incorrect standards, to hate to their heart's content, so as long as no violence is used as a means, to shout down people based on their demographics or political opinions, to be openly racist and sexist, to exclude and isolate and be generally malcontented with modernity, and to reject civil standards of values and etiquette in favor of antisocial norms. Um, he talks a little bit more about humanitarianism and then brutalism is the term basically uh, of the architecture where, where it's all stripped down to just its base nature and let's all just realize that architecture is purely functional and you don't need all the adornments, you just need functioning buildings, right? So. And immediately what happened in the wake of this article was brutalist groups started forming. And James, you probably remember this. And, and there was like in 2014, this big, strong reaction to this. But it really, now that you look back five years later, you go, Tucker was right about a lot of these impulses. And a lot of those people have been super attracted to, to the Trump era because it, it allows a lot of those more brutalist impulses to be exercised. And that's sort of what the left is saying in some ways, but they're trying to, it happened to me yesterday on Twitter, this local progressive was trying to tie me to the Proud Boys and basically say, well, the Proud Boys are libertarians, so you're the same thing. I was like, don't you dare try to equate the Proud Boys and counter groups to Antifa, the Pr Proud Boys more or less um, in places like Portland right now, uh, they identify as Proud Boys, although it was not the intent of the original group. Uh, but now they dress like Antifa and fight Antifa by Antifa means. And I go, I'm, com I'm completely against violence in all forms. I'm against Antifa, which that this person seemed to have no ability to condemn Antifa for their violent action. I condemn anybody on the right who uses violence like the Proud Boys. I condemn police who use violence as a tool or, or the military when the government sends the military to use violence to uh, libertarianism is at its core about nonviolence and not and, and using persuasion as opposed to force to achieve political and social means ends without violence, not means. So there's just this strain and, and you see so you see people trying to tie all this stuff together. You try trying to tie libertarians to some of these more base lines of thinking. The New York Times tried to do it uh, in an article, how the El Paso killer echoed the incendiary words of conservative media stars on August 11th, 2019. Just listen to this. So you get the idea, you know, everybody on Fox News is saying invasion, but you can go back and find Elijah Cummings, Barack Obama at one point said invasion in terms of illegal immigrants coming into the country in his 2008 campaign. There's an effort to tie, this is why violence is always a really poor way to do anything is because the violent people always get tied to the people who are not actually perpetrating violence. So. I just was saying in, in our group chat, like, I don't understand why libertarians 
look at a guy like this state rep who is clearly an unempathetic person and doesn't really care about anybody that isn't of his tribe, why they would support somebody who has power that clearly is saying they're inside voices outside. And so Nice and I had a long conversation. Now, the thing about that conservative, uh, and this is my first question to Nice, and here you pop in here at any time. Do you think that the El Paso killer at any point in the last five years turned on Rush Limbaugh or Fox News? <laughs> like, do you think that in, in his media diet, that guy ever saw any of the, those people saying any of that? Do you think that a kid who is making the choice to become basically a white supremacist killer is actually cons consuming boomer conservative media? No. Um, I don't think anyone in the last 10 to 15 years has. Right. Uh, yeah, I think it's, I think what happens is like the boomer media, like this 20 year old kid shot this place up. Right. And like, it has to be Rush Limbaugh because it's the only thing those other boomers on the other side can relate to like boomer Democrats. Like, it's got to be that Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh hasn't been relevant since, like, what, 2006? Probably, Before yeah. Before yeah. His, oxy, his oxy fall from grace. Yeah, the oxy yeah. and the podcast revolution. Right. I, I, I mean, know, so my question, my point is not to absolve these people of their duty to say responsible things behind the mic. But the fact is, is that you, you kind of set up like there's old racism, which is, you know, just proudly saying the N word and turning fire hoses on people. And then you talked about a new form of racism that you see as you go through all these underground communities. And th it kind of clicked into me when I heard that story later, I'm like, you know, a kid that is being radicalized in white supremacist groups that James and I talked about is probably not listening to Rush Limbaugh. They're just tying the two together because it's politically convenient. It's, uh, how would I put it? Um, it, it it's low-hanging fruit, right? So it, it's low-hanging fruit because I'm going to blame uh, conservative media for, like, the shit, like, internet trolls say, right? And if I'm digesting media, I, I wouldn't get it from Fox News, and I wouldn't get it from Rush Limbaugh because they're heavily censored. So when I look... When Rush Limbaugh, I don't think I even listed to Rush Limbaugh, but I don't think Rush Limbaugh says some really out there bullshit, right? I don't think he says that sort of stuff. Right. Now, it's mostly tapered because you're on the airwaves, you're tapered by the FCC. You really can't say ridiculous shit. Now, when you're on the internet, you can definitely say some ridiculous shit because who's going to stop you? You're like, mm -hmm. oh, you can get banned. Uh, I have 20 sock accounts. You can't really ban me. I mean, you, you can ban me, but I'll be back in like 20 seconds. Um, but what people understand and when people look at it from like the like a normie perspective is that's not new. <laughs> that's, that's not new at all. That's been there since the internet was basically started. Um, there's always groups like forums, even going back to like, this is really dating myself, but there used to be like a website called Lou links and it used to be called uh, losers, right? L U E S E R S. It used to be a gaming forum that you only got invited to by people that were currently members of that group or like uh, new grounds forums or any like sub forums on like any sort of gaming website or any sort of like counterculture website is just filled with those com those comments and that commentary. So it, it, it's just blaming media and blaming media personalities is just like I said, low hanging fruit because they're not really getting their information. They're not really getting their ideology. They're not really getting their mindset from any sort of media figure. It's the collective consciousness of probably like a hundred thousand users, 200,000 users in all parts of the internet. Do you think that Trump has some effect in some of that? that it makes it more acceptable that he fuels some of that online extremism fire? No, I think it's the only thing Trump does is it lets your grandpa be okay with it. Right. <laughs> so it's <laughs> now that Trump says it and he's like, yeah, you know, I hate the, I hate those liberals too. But your grandpa's like chuckling nervous as you're like throwing up Hitler salutes and shit around the house. Right. <laughs> okay. It's like, okay, you know, I see, I see. But 
it, it makes it so if I'm a 20 year old, I can get like some 40 year old to agree with me. Right. Or it's like, Oh yeah, but he might not agree with everything. And they're probably kind of spooked, you know, basically like what you're, what's coming out your mouth, what's on your screen, what you're saying in like group chats and stuff. They're probably spooked, but it's, well, at least he's, at least he's conservative, but they're not really conservative either. They're, I, I, they're, they're more nihilistic in their approach. It's not so much as, oh, I'm a conservative one, and like, you know, these are my values. There really is no value. The only really value you're kind of getting out of it is like how much anger I can incite and how much I can feed off that anger. So a kid like that is genuinely like, he doesn't care that he killed people. He's just excited that he was able to cause chaos. And that's really his motivation. Yeah. It, it's, hey, bros, watch me do it. I finally did it. You know, it's, I talked about it for like weeks and weeks and weeks on like, you know, social media websites, things like that. I'm now one of the few. I'm going to meme it up for my boys. You know, when me and the boys come into town, this is what we're going to do. Um, it was done for no other reason than just to do it because it's something you talked about, something you wanted to do. So people like get confused, like there has to be a common cause. I don't think there really is a common cause to it. I think it's just people wanting to do stuff that they have talked about doing and they feel like it's going to give them sort of credentials or some cred or some, I, I don't know, like um, an aura of invincibility that they are the ones that did it. Because you see like even before that, we had that shooting in New Zealand, where like he just basically spouted off memes in his manifesto and people were like in the forums, you know, on 4chan and on, you know, 8chan and on different websites, basically posting like Pepe memes, like, you know, laughing and Wojak memes. I think it's just to get the reaction from what they consider their peers, especially in the online community. How does, how did these guys get so disconnected from like empathy? I mean, how, how do you get so sociopathic that you think you, like killing somebody is like a video game? Uh, probably medications, uh, a culture that doesn't really value anything. And I would say probably if I'm, if I'm spending like 14 hours a day, nothing doing, nothing going on, I really have nothing to look forward to. I'm just kind of, how would I say, uh, just kind of coasting, right? If I'm just coasting and I've got no value in doing anything besides that. Uh, it's pretty. I'm pretty susceptible to kind of just doing what peers on the internet want me to do, and that kind of devalues things a bit. Where most people, they want to work for something. Like, oh, I got this job, I want to work for promotion, but if I'm not really working for anything going forward in the future, I'm kind of stuck in a position where it kind of doesn't matter what I do. So I might as well just go all out and just kind of be as ridiculous and obnoxious as I possibly can. Yeah, it seems to me that it it is. It starts with jokes. Because I, I saw I saw people in these brutalist groups, you know, making trying to say the most outrageous thing they could, so they'd make like anti-Semitic jokes, and like oh, I'm just supporting free speech by making these jokes, and then like a year later, they're anti-Semitic and they're basically now you know what I would consider all right. Some of these guys, I mean, it it seems mm -hmm. to start with some of the humor and trying to to joke around, but then eventually starts taking them down a rabbit hole to a place that's much much more serious you know i, I mean and, and it's not like like you're you're right like rush limbaugh and fox news they have bumper car they have bumpers up it's like bumper bowling because they have advertisers so they have to stay within the overton window of acceptable and allowable opinion right but when you're when you're in some of these groups in be it chat rooms or discord or 4chan or wherever and the bumpers are removed and there is no end really to how shot like the shock factor and the one upsmanship eventually be seems like it becomes the purpose so if they have no purpose outside of what the, what is on their phone or, or computer then that that becomes their purpose is that shock value i mean is that accurate Mm, I think that's putting too much blame or trying to put to onus on jokes or even internet chat rooms or saying like these groups. No, I'm not. I'm not putting the onus on that. That's like saying that the gun is responsible for the shooting. All right. Because I'm, I'm, just putting, saying... I'm putting the responsibility on the guy who is literally not making any effort in his life to improve his life. And he just ends up. It's like people, people, people try drugs for the first time. Mm -hmm. for maybe social reasons but then they eventually end up with a serious addiction 
Correct. You know, every everything within moderation. Like if your whole purpose, if your addiction is is trying to shock people, eventually that can take you to dark places. Yeah, it can. It can take you to dark places. I think these people like these have already have existed for you know, like hundreds of years, but mm-hmm. we've either like either dealt with them differently. People have dealt with them differently in the past. They've gotten different jobs, or we just kind of lost them because of that sociopathy at nature that they have developed. You know, a war will sprint out. They'll be the first ones to wanting to volunteer, jump in the freaking front line, and get their head blown off, or they end up doing something like that. Not yeah, saying everyone I, I, jumps up for you know who are going in the military or sociopaths. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying. I, I think kind of like we said in the the last episode where we talked about this. It's like the Vietnam War documentary that I saw. The guy goes, "Do you think the interviewer asked the, one of the soldiers, do you think the war makes man more violent?" And he goes, "I think it rips the mask off and you see who they really are." I think you see human beings in their natural state in war. We just hold it together with this thin veneer of civilization. And I think that's what some of this allows people to do is it allows them to, you know, one if 0.1% of these guys are just sociopathic killers, the, it, it's like ISIS gives them, gives means, or means, means to certain people to go and fulfill their sociopathic tendencies. And the one thing I do see the danger of it doing the jet rooms, the one thing I will give it for is the idea that because in the past, when someone had to go to somebody and say something this awful, they had to go somewhere. They had to leave their house. Right. We couldn't do it in the comfort of the own room. So these are like dive bar conversation, dive bar jokes you would tell, tell to somebody, right? They would do this, you know. <laughs> A lot of boomers will probably talk about him this 20, like, oh, I remember Dale. Dale was really cool in high school. Then he started making these weird jokes when we were going at the bar, drinking PBR after going at the mine right. for five hours. And now, he, you know, now look at him. He's in the Klan rally, you know. But I think the difference with them going up and shooting people and stuff like that is the aspect of that. At least they have some sort of community because they had to go out and physically touch someone. Maybe it's right. doing something because they are behind a screen. They don't have that sense of, like, full physical community. Right. If if I remember correctly, a like a Dayton shooter, right? So like there was a girl that wrote an article because she knew him, and like apparently she was in like an open relationship and like having sex with this dude, and then he wanted to go further, and she didn't really want that because he's kind of like fucked up in the head, right? Mm-hmm. And then a couple months later, he does the shooting, and it's like, is it a question of uh, the way society is sort of set up now? And they're longing for something that's no longer there where I, I, I like this girl or I like this thing or I like this thing I want and I could just go get it. He didn't matter. Right. Like, you know, if I was like in the fifties, like 1950s, 1940s, 1930s, I could go get a wife pretty easy. Uh, now I can't, we've had, you know, the 1960s revolutions we've had, uh, you know, the sexual revolution, we've had a lot more progress in the individuality. So, getting rejected by some sort of woman like that does a lot of mental damage to someone that doesn't believe in the system that's currently set up in place. Because often when I see, you know, these manifestos, or I look at the post, they're very like misogynistic, very, yeah. very misogynistic. Mis- you know? Misogyny it, seems to be the glue that holds a lot of this together. And it's like, okay, well, what's, what's the difference, you know, between now and like 20, 30 years ago. And, even now, right, I can look back 10, even 10, 15 years on my part. So I could go, I can remember directly and distinctively if I go to like, you know, a, a dating website now compared to 10 to 15 years ago, that the women behave and act differently. And in, in back, in, back in my high school, back in my high school, there was, the best way to put it was, I was when I was in high school, it was like the whole emo phase, right? So everybody wanted to be the scene kid. Everybody wanted to do that. There was a different personality that kind of goes through, and it was like, okay, I'm depressed. You know, like you coming out the '90s, everybody's like, I'm depressed. I don't want that. So there's a lot of low self-esteem, and I felt like because of that low self-esteem, that a lot of people were pretty much exploited. Like, oh yeah, you got low self-esteem. I can definitely like exploit that. People are essentially predators to some extent. They pick yeah. up on that. Uh, now it's just like, catch my Instagram, you know, subscribe to my Snapchat, buy my gamer girl bathwater, right? So it's right. So if you're one of these guys who, and you're on, there is a, there is an exploit, and I did do get this, like having been on Tinder and Bumble and all that, there's a ton of exploitation 
where it is women taking advantage of the reversal of the sexual marketplace, essentially, or, or the hypersexual. Like, I just don't find any of it to be healthy. Like, if you're on there, it's 100 rejections an hour. The human brain is not built to be rejected that many times. And it is, it's, and that goes both male and female. But men but have, you, but men get on these sites and like they act horribly. And super protectionism because they come across so many dirtbags who are so aggressive and want to take out their, their misogyny on women in the DMs. These, like, oh, you're not going to message me back? Well, fuck you, bitch. You know, it is like a really crazy, like I do in some, in, in some ways think online dating, especially the Tinder era, people want to blame Facebook and Twitter for our, 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 our bullshit environment, man. I think the swipe apps have really broken down dating relationships, social, the social fabric in a lot of ways. It's made men and women more distrustful of each other. I think it's really kind of a net negative. I don't know many people who actually met on one of those apps. I, I disagree with the swipe out. I think the real the real crux here was when streaming services like I'm going like back to mixers to your twitches to your omegles right so streaming okay. services um, prior to like you know early 2000s right if I were playing if I were in a gaming community it's a very insulated gaming community it's basically me my bros whoever else is fucking playing a game on there girls are unheard of if they're saying they're a girl in the online chat they're probably a dude trying to like you know like, like a pedophile or something no one believed it and if they did believe it they just shower you in gold or whatever right. but it's a very insular community it's a very uh, how would I put it introverted community now we have Twitch streams, and lo and behold, women found out that if I go on Twitch streams, all these gamer boys are going to come to my channel. They're going to give me cash. And then it just kind of sparks the thing. You see, like, a lot of people on, like, you know, uh, dating apps now that are kind of like, uh, oh, I'm a brat or I'm a little. You know, it's like, what here's my that? Snapchat, here's my PayPal. It's, it's, it's a BDSM <laughs> term for people that want to be basically babied. It's basically, I'm looking for a pay pig. Right. Yeah. So you see, like a lot of these terms pop up all the time, either on like Tumblr or any social media site. Like, what here's is, my uh, Snapchat. A pay pig is what? Like somebody who's just sending you stuff, off, a, a girl off for of a wish list all the time, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So that. So that became really prevalent, right? So like around 2012, 2013, it started getting more and more prevalent. You start seeing these terms on a lot of. I know you're on Tinder. I know you've seen those terms. Like I'm a little. I know you swipe through your Reddit like multiple times. You might not think you've read it, but you've definitely seen it somewhere. You've probably seen Snapchats in, in on Tinder profiles. So, oh, so the Snapchats on the Tinder profiles are not because they want they're they're adding you as basically lead generation. Correct. They're yeah, they're adding you because you're a cash flow. Yeah, and I big. I felt and and I felt like that's probably the most harmful thing that's occurred to it, especially when it comes to like you know male and female relationships. Because women at this point in time, because of the streaming services, how easy it is to stream and how easy you can exploit, you know, basically men that have, you know, self-esteem issues. It's, I'm using them as revenue generation, which is why you get people that they report all these people like the IRS, people that troll, people that do stalking and stuff. I think it, the role reversal in basically in the 90s when men would like exploit, you know, scene girls, you know, because of low self-esteem has been reversed where women are now exploiting like vulnerable men because they're in basically isolated communities or they're just not that good with like women or whatsoever. So now the roles are reversed and I feel like men are not able to cope with that to some degree. Yeah. And it's just leads to issues. Well, it's dehumanizing and, and anytime you're de you're commoditizing other people and dehumanizing them, there are, there are consequences to that. You know, these, these men make, the conscious choice to engage in these transactions and that's their choice and it's the choice of the female to engage in that but all of it seems really unhealthy i, I, I think once and the, i was going to say and those boys and those men who are doing that would they're also do also being attacked with this without the social safety net or anyone 
understanding their issue or their plight. If you see a guy taking advantage of a vulnerable woman who has low self-esteem as issue, there's a massive social network that will help this woman out. The guy says, like, well, you ran out of money. That's your own fault. You played the game. Get out. Right. There's a harshness. There's a, an isolation that it, it's you, like you become a pariah almost as opposed to somebody that is clearly dealing with issues and needs help. I, I think it's it's a dangerous game, at least in this aspect. The people that, like the gamer girl, bathwater girl, right? Where she's selling basically her bathwater. The people that are giving you the most money are the most mentally damaged, hmm. right? So most normal people, like I can look at streams, I don't give a fucking dime. You know, like you're not getting right. my money, I'm just, I'm just following your chat. But there's people that give money. And there's people that give more money than other people. The people that start giving more money or the people that are under a delusion that if I give her $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, she'll give me one-on-one -on -one intimate time. But here's where it breaks down. Like, let's say I'm that dude that's just really paying her tons of money to get intimate time with her, one-on-one -on -one time in Discord, or basically just for her to notice me, right? Right. And then, like, you know, in the private Discord that she, they use, these people usually set up where they talk to their fans, and then she says something that – no dude that does that wants to hear this is a picture of me and my boyfriend he took me to disney world right there dude anger anger right. anger anger i just gave you ten thousand dollars on trip stream you didn't tell me you had a boyfriend because they believed in their mind that if i gave her all this money she might go out with me i might be her boyfriend now mm -hmm. that illusion shattered you just shattered that illusion so now the dude's pissed off. So now the dude goes into like a rage. He's basically DDoSing you. He's basically reporting you to the police. He's trying to SWAT you. You know, he's doing everything he possibly can in petty vengeance to get back at you. And it's that sort of mentality that kind of escalates everywhere else. Where if I don't get what I want, what I expect in my like delusion I built up around myself, I'm going to basically react and take it out on whoever's around me, which is what these shooters tend to do. And I'm not saying it's like usually a girl in this case. It could be in numerous things. But usually there's an illusion that was crafted. And somewhere at this point, this illusion was shattered. And this illusion being shattered, and the only way I can really react to it to make – I'm in pain. I'm writhing in pain. How am I going to make people like feel my pain? I'm going to do something to make them feel my pain. It could be something you know, like basically petty, basically smashing up a car or some windows or doing some like petty vandals or it could just be shooting in place. I don't know people's mental state when that occurs. But I feel like because of these streaming services, because of how open the internet is, these isolated communities, what goes through and what's said in these communities, how basically men interact with other men, how men are interact with women, how it's become so commercialized, artificial, and basically non-realistic that it's basically created a giant subculture of people that are basically permanently angry, distressed, and don't know how to react. Yeah, and then they do interact with a woman in real life, and there's just, it's, is that basically how incel, like, where did the term incel fit into all this? Is that, is that guy an incel? Like, how does that work? It, it was a, an incel was like originally just a term to make fun of, like, you know, men that were, basically feminine it's like oh man you got to be an incel because you're basically white knighting this girl so hard right basically you're just a virgin it's basically like a a new term for like dude you're just a 40 year old virgin you know what i mean it's it's basically it, it's basically why we when 20 years ago when i was in high school you called somebody gay because you, you weren't yeah. saying that they you weren't saying that they were gay you were saying that they were less they're less manly than you basically was what you were yeah doing. it's a masculine insult so it was basically stated on the internet Women co-opted it to some degree. So like, oh, you're just an incel, you know, like no one's really going to pay attention to you. And I think it's when women say, as opposed to men, let's say, is really kind of gets under people's skin. And I, I'm not too sure why that occurs. But I think when masculinity is attacked, I think it's more okay for a man to attack some other man's masculinity than it is for a woman to attack someone's masculinity. I think, I think that's, that has like a part. <laughs> yeah, I think it's deep set into our, in our, into our DNA. I mean – so I read this study about dating and women in dating situations, their number one fear is safety, right? They want security and they don't want to be hurt or attacked. But men's number one fear is rejection. And that's because, you know, we still have prehistoric brains. I mean, we've really only been, we only know about 10,000, roughly 10,000 years of human history out of the 200,000, 300,000 that exists. And for most of that time, we traveled in small tribes and if you got to a point as a man where none of the women, like basically everybody would sleep with everybody 
And so you didn't know who was your son. It could be your son. It could be Harry's son. I mean, it, I think we'd tell if it was like Harry's son versus mine. But uh, you, you, that's why every all the men just kind of took care of all the kids and all the women. And it was just like one social cohesive unit. But His, if you name, is a, right, His name is Demonte. His name is Demonte. <laughs> it, right and if you got to a point where your behavior or your usefulness was so outside of the norm which is why shame and guilt all uh, all all come into play shame is other people guiding you into the social norms and guilt is your own inner conscience guiding you into the social norms of the group if you if you ran out of women that would fuck you you were out you were cast out of the group rejected from the group and it basically was a death sentence like, you just stay here, we're moving on, and you were eaten by a tiger the next day. And so rejection is, in men specifically, it, in brain scans, triggers like a, a ton more than it does even women. So I think that that plays into it. If you have no tribe already, and you're completely isolated, and then women are calling you incels because you have no prospect of ever being fucked, like, pre like your prehistoric brain at some point goes your amygdala goes uh oh uh oh uh oh you're and you immediately go into the defensive stance and when a person is in the defensive stance span stance and they're spiraling and they have mental health issues or they're over medicated or they're using substances like that's a dangerous spiral i mean in domestic violence cases for instance how it ends is what story the the abuser tells themselves you know it is the person like an abusive guy, but he has like a good family unit that can kind of reel him in? Or is this a person who just is completely isolated? Well, most of those end up in death, like one or, one or both of them end up dead. And, and so the social unit really does matter. That rejection, I think, really does play a big part into a lot of this stuff. And I think it's, it's not talked about because people haven't put it together or, or the media specifically is too busy pushing their own agenda to figure out what's actually going to solve this problem. The episode of the Chris Spangle show that's in the feed that where we talk about mass shootings, it go back to the instance where the, the guy's spent 10 grand on the woman and he loses his shit. Well, that, that is a triggering episode that just sets off a dangerous chain of events. And if there is an intervention, he either kills himself, her, uh, or goes on a mass shooting spree. There's some sort of, violent action that takes place but if there is some culture in place where we start intervening in young men who are in trouble we're going to have a lot less mass shootings we're going to have a lot less suicides we're going to have a lot less domestic violence but i don't we, we never seem to have this conversation and i don't know why i don't know if it's because the the media is so far left that they're bent towards um leftist progress you know like feminism is is a big reason why i'm sure there are feminists who have listened to you kind of talk about this predatory behavior from women in these twitch streams and they're bristling and they're like oh well this is offensive it's like well this is a real cause of a lot of anguish for a certain segment of our population you know all by choice granted but it still doesn't make it right or healthy okay so the people that are upset with uh niece's comments on like the the twitch streams right if you think about it these are kid. some of them are young adults kids 16 17 year old you know kids that are first get addicted to this thing and they get on this site where they go for gaming and then you guys basically have softcore porn i think it's a gundam references as my first my free cam star the way they you know reference like some of these twitch streams and that's how they are predatory or predatory on if you had you know, older man dancing and young women pouring money at him, there'd be huge uproars. The main thing what, what I think would help a lot of it is just seeing the plight of, you know, of men and just giving them the same type of empathy you would give any, any human or especially, you know, a female in our society. That is what... Hmm? I said it's also probably like an issue with... There's a, a, a trend of over-sexualization, over-masculization. That's not just for men. That's also for women as well. Um, you, you have to keep in mind that even though you are a human, you're still an animal. You're still a mammal. You still fall into like an animal kingdom, a phylum, a genus. You go all the way down the list. Um, usually, 
yeah, most structures, you know, if I look at primates or I look at any other like, sort of stuff that's kind of related to us, there's usually a hierarchical structure. There's always like, the, you're always going to have this alpha male, you're always going to have like these beta males. And usually the alpha male spends most of his time, it's not even like really just defending against intruders, right? It's not just going, it's not the male lion fighting off hyenas. They're not fighting off hyenas. The male lion of that pride is fighting other fucking lions. It's basically all these things are going to encroach and be aggressive because the first thing any other male comes into because he's not the one that's in a hierarchy that says these are my women, these are women that love me, is pretty much I'm going to rape all these women and I'm not going to stop until you come fight me. And that's a toxic behavior that occurs in mammals. Like you can see that in primates. Usually you look at gorillas. Usually if another male tries to do something like that, it usually ends in a lot of violence really quickly. Um, we, we are related to that. And I feel like just because you have thousands of years of like civilization, you know, built upon like your, your logical mind doesn't mean you still don't have primal instincts that occur like that. So I think when women reject men to that degree or women become hyper masculine, hyper sexualized, it basically just does something to how we view things on a primal mind. Like, Hey, this isn't right. Like you're, brain your caveman brain's clicking in this isn't right this doesn't feel right to me you know yeah i think that's an important i think that's an important point to emphasize like it is up to the man to deal with his own feelings of rejection women have every right and responsibility to reject any man that they don't want to date they're they're, we're not and we're we are not saying that uh well women you just need to take one for the team that is not what we're saying at all in a lot of ways i think the me too movement has been really good for empowering women to stop dating a lot of these guys, but guys instead, some of these nuts, instead of, I I mean, I frankly had a friend in 2014 sit me down and go, listen, you're talking to me in a way that is just passive aggressive and awful. And like, if you're talking to women that you want to date this way, then that's why you're single. And I'm like, oh, and instead of blaming her and go, you fucking bitch. (laughs) I realized, oh, I need to change. I need, you know, and and it's a big reason I went into therapy. And you know, it's uh, women have every responsibility and right to reject men, and men have every responsibility to accept that rejection. Not every rejection is meant to attack your self worth. I think people in this day and age they get rejected so much that eventually they just they they start to feel like they're worthless like they have a problem they're not worth it's like no like your person there's so much choice that people can hyper tailor to their personal choice the mate that they want to choose and just because this person watches too much sports or or this person eats their peas weird as the seinfeld episode goes like it doesn't mean that your worth is is less it just means that you're not right for that person and and i think Emotional and mental health really comes at the core of a lot of this. Let me let me get into the racism part of this because I think the misogyny part is the key to it. I think that was an important aspect to a lot of this thinking. But you had an, an interesting point on racism, James. Um, I, I guess I don't get why when I talk to a lot of these guys who I would describe as brutalists, why they don't seem to – they just can't seem to acknowledge – that racism does exist on some level in our society. Like I get that, that the, like the New York times admitting basically that their 1619 project, part of their goal is to tie a direct line from slavery to the election of Trump. It's like, good luck claiming that 50% of the country just loves slavery because they're not Democrats. Like uh, I, I get that that it, that impulse exists in a lot of major media writers and and outlets, but that doesn't mean that the ghosts of slavery don't exist. Like uh, I, I think, as Radley Valco was saying, or I'm not sure what he, but slavery existed for 250 years. A hundred years after that, it was encoded into law in the Jim Crow laws. It's kind of foolish for us all to believe that in a generation we're just going to get rid of racists and racist impulses you know the election of barack obama obviously was an important signal that our society is is becoming more egalitarian and and being more tolerant but at the same time there there still is a level of racism and bigotry and tribalism in our country in our world and maybe that's just human nature but at the end of the day like to never admit that as a point 
some of these guys are just so unwilling to ever accept that any single man was guilty of some sexual crime or some charge of racism. I, I don't I don't get what is it, what is it with the complete denial that racism exists. I mean, everybody, I'll, I'll be honest, everybody to some degree has some sort of racist bone in them, right? And that's just based on the fact that people like to hang out with people that are like them. Right. It's how basically communities function. It's how society functions. So when someone is different, right, and it doesn't have to be see skin tone, and I, it really has less to do with skin tone than besides like cultural behaviors, right? So so economics I'm, play into it. You want to hang out with people that are kind of in your class, you know? Like, yeah, I totally get what you mean. Like, so when when I hear com people complain, like if I'm online, I'm reading just like some like trollish like racist comments, and it's just like you know when I hear like oh we was kings or he didn't do nothing, right? And what the, what this comes down to. And it's not just because like the guy's black, you know, it's not, it's not because of his skin tone. It's, it goes deeper to like a level where like, I'm looking at the culture. And if I'm a middle-class white dude from the Midwest, right. And then I go take a look at, you know, the culture in Indianapolis, let's say 42nd and post. It's a very, very, very different culture. It's very, it's loud. It's aggressive. It's like, whoa, I don't like this shit. I don't have to roll my windows. Why are they approaching me to fucking sell weed? Why is he fucking like starting fights in the parking lot? You see that behavior, and then you associate that behavior with this whole subgroup of people. So when they complain about that, it's like, oh, he did another shooting. It's another, you know, you know, there goes the Kangs again. It's basically applying behaviors in these communities. Just like with the Chinese and the Japanese, you apply certain behaviors. Like the Japanese are very, very, very racist. Did you just very discover racist. stereotypes? <laughs> Harry, yeah. he just discovered stereotypes. You heard yeah. it right here on the program. <laughs> we just, yeah. But the Japanese are racist, right? I can. They basically have laws on the books. They have ways they behave with people that are foreigners, how they interact with foreigners, what they can and can't do. It's. I think it's just a reality, and I think civil people, people that want to get along with everybody, understand that, and they try their best to. I'm going to look past what these stereotypes are. I'm going to look past of what, you know, a prejudicial thing I'm saying on a community is. Now, adults can do that, but some people just don't do that, right? Are, are, like, so, so are you saying that's good or are you just like, how, how are you, uh, are you saying stereotypes are good? Like, I, I, clarify that a little bit. Stereotypes are good. No, um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think they exist, right? They just exist. There's always a reason behind why certain stereotypes exist. And it's just because it's a common repeated behavior with certain cultural groups. Like white people don't like spices. You know, they're going to put salt on it this time. It, it, it's just behaviors I, that I, for pick one, up am much. annoyed that I made boiled chicken for Harry and he did not like it. I even put pepper on it. Just pepper. Just pepper. Yep. Mm. See, but. I think the difference is, is when you can like look at the stereotypes, you can kind of laugh at them, and that's a way to kind of overcome what they are. But the opposite effect is when you look at a stereotype and you apply it negatively. It's like I don't want to associate with these people because they do these certain things, and like that's what breeds that sort of like hatred and commitment on online communities, where instead of looking at it as like, eh, it is what it is. They take it and says like, "Oh, look at this behavior," and they start applying it to every single thing they do. Everything, certain people group. The Chinese always do this. African Americans always do this. Any story, any new story that involves these cultural groups becomes a talking point with these certain stereotypical things, and that's where you get a lot of like this internal race of, "Oh, we're not being racist. We're just, you know, uh, just laughing at it." Okay, right. well, it. it if you were just laughing, it's like a passing joke, what, whatever, but it's a common everyday theme for you. <laughs> you know, it's a common everyday theme. So is it more than you just be like, oh, yeah, that's, that's kind of funny? Or is it like, hey, you're spending like a good solid 14 hours on like, you know, Facebook groups talking about the same exact thing? Are you dwelling on the stereotype, trying to make it a reality as opposed to just something that's just like, oh, it's kind of weird, it's kind of funny? Right. 
Yeah. Well, the other thing is that you have to understand, just like our prehistoric brains, we make stereotypes. Your brain is just lazy and it does it. Your brain does this even when reading words or seeing stuff on the, on the map. Just like I've said before previously that the more times you're going to have a car accident is probably in your first five miles, either from your destination that you traveled all the time. So you're five miles from your job, five miles from your house, because you travel that road for so much, your brain kind of goes into a malaise because it's like, well, I've seen this road. I've seen this road so much, so many different times. It just forgets it, just drops the information. So they, you just, you know, and because it stares, it's like, nope, nope, it's the same road you've seen times at time. You know these roads. These roads are like that. And that's why people hit potholes all the time. Right, Nice? But, I will bulldoze any pothole. <laughs> Because you you know you just kind of like oh I know these roads these roads are my roads boom boom oh no I got hit by these roads you know well, these yeah. are old roads I mean it's just I think that the the problem is is the world would probably be a lot better if we understood that people are flawed and people so, and communities are flawed and groups of people are flawed and he understood it and it was just like it is what it is I don't give a shit right yeah and but instead of dwelling on it and trying to make it a political point all the time, when you try to make it a political point, you're trying to do a win. You're trying to win over something. And when you're trying to win over something, it becomes an issue of superior inferiority. So like I look at like, you know, where the roots of like all this sort of stuff comes. It's like, did the, did Europeans like, you know, basically buy slaves because they're like, man, I really hate these black people. No, it's just, they rolled up and it's like, I have guns and horses and ships and you're just kind of there. Um, same with like Aztecs and Mayans when Cortez rolled up. I have guns and cannons and you're just over here dancing to moonlight. <laughs> Guess what? You know? Guess what's gonna happen? Um, the Chinese did it to multiple cultures. I mean, every culture's done this to some extent. And it's just based on this aspect of, you know, oh, I see these people as inferior, and that's trickled down through like hundreds of thousands of years. And so now you see like, well, these people are this. I mean, let's, let's just be real. Like I'm, I'm a white dude in the Midwest. I have a certain thing I do when I'm home. So I behave certainly a certain way at work. And if I go to like, you know, like a barbecue in the hood, it's, it's a total culture shock because barbecues in Whiteville and like my little suburban area is basically like some dude and like, you know, some new balances being like, do you want it? Well done. You know, I got a one six sauce. But then I go to a black barbecue. It's loud music. Hundreds of people there that I don't even fucking know, and they're really, like, yeah, and it irritates but, people. That is true. If I would have took Chris to a barbecue and he would have acted the way he was when I was smoking those ribs at Jeremiah's, Spangle wouldn't be here right now. He would have got <laughs> shot like twice the moment he opened that smoke route, letting all that smoke out to take an Instagram photo. They don't know what he was. He was like, "What are you doing?" Try to make this tough. I didn't bring the good dentures, you know. <laughs> then, then I, then I feel like it gets misinterpreted, right? So it gets misinterpreted by if I'm used to my like white suburban barbecues with his dad, mom, and like you know hot dogs and shit. Then I go to like my first black <laughs> barbecue where it's like loud music, you know, tons of people. Basically, like everybody in the the block is there, and you know, then I'm like, I say something, being like, oh, that's not how I do it, and then the culture I'm like integrating with or trying to talk to at the time basically is going to be sarcastic and they're okay. Like, Oh, well, I don't know how you're going to do it. White boy. And they laugh. And then you respond to that negatively. It's like, you're about to instigate a fight. Well, <laughs> like, I'll, I'll give you a good example. Like I had a tough time in the beginning on the pat down with Miss Pat and, and Dion to some extent, but mainly Miss Pat where, you know, we're sitting there, the three of us are sitting there having conversations over the last eight months. Mm -hmm. And, I just got a notification. Trump postpones meeting with Dutch PM after she says Greenland is, isn't for sale. So petty. <laughs> <laughs> so in the beginning of the pat down, you know, when I, I mean, I knew Dion and Miss Pat, like enough to say hi, but I didn't know them. Like I know now I'm not like friends. Like things would get so heated and things, conversations would get so loud and I would feel so like pressured and I would get like squirmy. Right. Mm -hmm. because people are yelling at me and miss pat just finally goes chris we are not yelling at you this is how black people talk 
we 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 respect what you would like you we wouldn't even talk to you if we didn't like she had to just kind of say like you need to relax like we're not yelling at you we're not mad at you because i i don't like that i'm a people pleaser so like when somebody's yelling at me i'm like i'm so sorry you know but that that's been kind of the fun part of the pat down is like trying to have ha like Miss Pat is just from such a different culture than I'm from. And she lives in the culture that I grew up in. And so she doesn't, she's lived there long enough and her kids went to school there. So she gets it, you know, but she's just like, you don't understand anything about black culture. I'm like, I know my only black friend, friend is Harry. And uh, like, so it has been interesting to kind of be uh, in conversation with Ms. Pat in ways that I'm not used to conversing. Like that's one very real cultural difference that was kind of blocking our ability to become friends until she finally just was like, seriously, you need to realize I'm not yelling at you. I'm not mad at you when I boss you around. Like, that's just how I talk. I was like, Oh, okay. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, so it is like, there's cultural differences, but let's go back to like the guy, the, the shooters or whatever. Cause this is like, we're, we're talking about, basic like foundational stuff i want to get back to the guys who are kind of on the 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 dregs of the internet like do you think that a guy like the state rep or donald trump or media figures who kind of cater to these guys um do they is there coded like this like let's i want to talk about like the okay sign or the milk or or the stuff where it's like we did this as a joke and, and, and Reinhold always kind of makes the point. It's like, yeah, it may have begun as a joke, but at a certain point, like racists started using it to be racist. Like how do you, how do you differentiate that? I mean, is there some element that when, is it all just jokes or is it coded language and dog whistles? Like how do you differentiate that James? A thing becomes a dog whistle, right? When like I'm using like the okay side, right? People have been using it since I was a kid. Like, oh, okay, right? Right. So if I do something and then someone that freaks out and says, this could be coded language, and then people are like, hey, dude, check out this fucking Twitter post, right? The girl's freaking out thinking I'm doing some weird shit with, like, these okay signs. Then it starts to go from there. It starts to roll downhill. Um, I, I feel like none of this would have been an issue if basically partisans on the other side wouldn't have made it an issue, like the milk, the okay sign, the MAGA hats, right? All that stuff wouldn't have been an issue unless they started attributing what basically like these illusions that the other side makes up where it's like, oh, you, you definitely voted Republican, so you must be a racist. I'm putting that illusion on someone else and basically I'm going to make everybody that votes Republican a racist, right? Um, it's just that behavior where – if I'm going to get that reaction out of you by throwing an okay sign and it gets to a point where like wall street journal is basically posting, you know, articles about it, it then started out as a troll. But you know, if the other side believes that's what that is, then that's what it is at this point, at least to those, that group of people. But I feel like that's just a problem with groups of people kind of dictating what things are and what things are speech, what is speech, what isn't really, really speech, what's, you know, symbology, what's coded, and I feel like people are manufacture their own narrative. And I feel like it's like a common theme, especially when you talk to people on the far right and on the far left. They don't go into like a thing where like, I just want to talk about it or just kind of argue about it, just have like a debate. They've already had like an entire, you know, from like dawn of time to like 20 years in the future, an entire narrative already constructed. So you're not talking to these people. You're basically trying to cut through their narrative. But anytime you try to cut through a narrative, they'll basically move a goalpost or re-expand the narrative. So these people are so entrenched on both sides of the spectrum that it doesn't matter what you say. Um, we've all had arguments on Facebook where like you could literally post statistical data, you know, cause it'll demand evidence and you post the statistical data in the moment you post the link, they already discredit the link. Oh, it's, you know, blah, 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 this, blah, blah, blah. They already discredit data. So they're not even interested in your data. You can even post it from like multiple sources. They'll just look at the link, not even click on it, just start discrediting everything down the line. So if that's the if, if that's how we're doing politics in like 2020, right, where like you can't have discussions, anything you say is evidence, anything you say is like what you view and what you state is like your own personal opinion is going to automatically be discredited and basically labeled as something, then there's no point in doing it. So if I'm like a like going back to the shooter. 
if that's a world I'm living in where it's so black and white, you know, where it's like anybody I talk to is either some dude that hundred percent agrees with me and tells me to do fucking crazy shit or talk about crazy shit. And the next person I talk to is like, I can just say hello and they're going to bark at me that I'm a racist because I have a narrative constructed based on like other stuff I've said or things I've like associated with or things I've even liked. Then it's a world of absolutes, you know? So it doesn't matter what I do. I'm always going to be this to this person, this to this person. So I'm already living in this duality where it's like, um, I'm just going to go shoot up a place because it's what's expected of me at this point, you know, at this point in time, I'm already a loser. I have nothing to live for. It's already expected of me to do that. So I feel like the world, at least the political world has kind of crafted into like what it is. You, you see it on the debates, right? You, you do it in any democratic debate. And it's just a world of like, I crafted this huge narrative that this is what it is. We've got to beat Donald Trump. You know, we're going to say, I promise all these crazy fucking things are never going to pass in a million years. But it's just that political party from this example play into a narrative that they think is going to get them where they want to go just like trump plays to that narrative on his end with the tweets he says mean shit because that's the narrative people want him to play do you think trump really gives a shit about half the stuff he says in the twitter feed probably not right. dude just counts money and banks you know sluts that's what, that's what he did for like 20 30 years before he even began to think about politics but that's the narrative people want they want this asshole you know tweeting out mean things so that's right. the narrative he plays Jane or uh, Harry, whatever your name is, you, you people. You, you, oh, oh, oh! So it's you people now. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm kind of right. That's the money thing. I always got like, I always get upset at the whole like dog whistle comment. Like, this is a dog whistle for this. This is a dog whistle for that. But it's like, I'm, you know, like, all right. So you got to. I always got weirded out by that whole. So you can't say it's almost like pigeonholing the, just like James was going on. It pigeonholes the conversation. You already called it a dog whistle before I could even explain myself or what I mm-hmm. was doing. You know, you, you've already crafted the narrative. You've already written the article. You already got the blog post ready to go. And then our all our algorithms and everything that we use is all built on t- on top of these like systems. You know, like debunking your truth. You know. Chris Spangle destroyed, you know, these are things we'll actually catch with SEO optimization on YouTube and which people will search for. So it feeds the people who write these articles and pushes everyone to this narrative. I just think I mean, it comes down to if you have a platform, you have to be responsible with it and you should try to treat people with some measure. I was having an exchange about Andy No and Portland and Antifa. And this person is very clearly like, on the side of Antifa and was trying, was participating in this Twitter conversation where they were trying to imply that because I retweeted a video of yeah. Antifa that I clearly was a proud boy. And, and I just go, what kind of, like, do you think that uh, you should be beat up for your political beliefs? And this person said, yes, if I were a Nazi, it's like, well, you're a communist and they've killed more people than Nazis. So like, do you think I should be allowed to beat you up because you believe in, in socialism or, and communism? Like, I, 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 there's just this weird right. impulse that, like, it really comes down to just nonviolence. Like, see, this other person Can you may, may be on the other side from you, but, like, just start with the premise that they're a human being with feelings and a family and treat them with respect. And, like, I feel like that's where we have to start. Like and then everybody, it takes out the violence from it. It takes out the anger from it because then this isn't a person you have to destroy. This is just a person that you can converse with because they just have a different point of view and you can try and understand where they're coming from, and hopefully they'll do the same. And if they don't, like if they're just this type of person who's like, well, I'll I'll punch fascists and you're a fascist, like well then I'm gonna block you. Like I have no time to discuss anything with you. I have productive amazing people that i could mm. converse with and i you're not one of them so correct every, correct every time they open their mouth it's like okay you're the reason why uh you're the real reason i need an ar-15 you you who won't have a conversation with me you who wanted to destroy me and end my existence just for existing and i'm not what you say i am right you don't not care do I, you don't see me as a person you see me as an avatar and mm. that's really what i think we have to cut through is Look at these kids who are on these forums as people that probably need some intervention. I mean, Lord knows, Harry, we need to intervene in James's life. Yeah. Well, the other thing is also allowing people to walk things back. I think the only person, 
in the history of, of all things, right, of in this <laughs> now woke culture who's able to walk back their past has been in front of a camera, right, is Philip DeFranco. And it's the weirdest thing in the world that people have gotten, go after these old comments, but Phil, no one has touched Philip DeFranco. I'm not saying, oh, we need to cancel Philip DeFranco, but, but like, he's the only one that has the ability to walk that back. Is it because he stayed in front of the camera and then grew in front of the camera the entire time and then left all it up and then they watched him walk it all back? He watched him like grow and walk it back? I don't know. But I think a lot of that of allowing people to walk it back you know, Oprah was that way for a lot of people in the 90s. A lot of the talk shows are like, you see a lot of people like, yeah, I was a racist and blah, blah, blah. This is how I did. And this is how I've walked a lot of this back. I don't believe any of them. That, you know, stuff I did in my youth, don't believe any of that anymore. I grew as a person. Someone has changed my, changed my worldview because someone came with me with compassion and empathy and they allowed to someone to walk back. Right. Ian is doing the exact same thing with Christopher Cantwell. He's trying to was trying to get him to walk some of that back it's like you know if you're gonna have like it's like you probably won't be ready for it but Ian goes like i'm here when you're ready to come back somebody may think he doesn't deserve a path back but he's human he's going to be alive we can't just cancel him and put him on an island you know australia's full they won't let us bring put any more on people in australia <laughs> that's that's where you're wrong kiddo <laughs> <laughs> but no i i, I think that's that what we're buying back. greenland to put people there Cancel yeah, it's our, it's, our, it's our Australia. But I, I, I think it also has to do with like people have faces, right? People put faces on depending on what they're doing and who they're talking to and what their target audience is, right? Mm -hmm. So even like even like everyday people, right? We're three here. We're talking. How we're talking on this podcast is different. How we're going to talk at Triton Brewery is different. How like if Chris ever showed up is <laughs> different. Chris is gonna talk but even then, like even when we go from here, like how Chris talks about when we're just kind of hanging around mm -hmm. and how Chris speaks on his podcast, then probably how Chris speaks at his job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I say stuff, same thing with Harry and myself, right? Harry, Harry speaks differently on Discord than he does in like Triton than he does in his job. And it's, it's a face you have to put on because everybody around you has an expectation, right? There's different expectations. Like is, is it, um, Uh, how how would I say? Sometimes you have to have a different face depending on where you go. So, yeah, different mask. Or it's different, it different mask. social norms and different aspects. Like you, it's not you're not being two faced if you're different at work than you are with your wife, for instance. Like it's just different levels of intimacy. There's different rules. That's why we have social norms. There's just different behaviors for different places, and they're you know like this is a permanent conversation. You can't. Like, that's the thing that it, podcasting, you know, that's always scared me about this particular show is a lot of it is thinking out loud and trying to talk through things. And, and we've gotten better about trying to think things through and prep and then talk. But it's still my personal beliefs on a lot of different things have evolved a lot over the years, but it's permanent. It's on your permanent record. It's for a media matters to go and comb through if I ever got big enough. Like they're. That, that's different than a, a fleeting conversation that you have with close friends at a bar. But if we're going to get to a place where what you say in fleeting conversations at a bar 15 years ago are now going to ruin your public career because it's forever, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a whole different – that's a scary proposition. And I think, I think terror comes into a lot of it. I think that there is in a lot of quarters in this country, there's terror uh, in, in the hearts and minds of a lot of Americans, whether it's – the loss of free speech, the loss of gun rights, the existence of guns, the ability for somebody to speak in a way that is violent. You know, the, like for every side, there is, you know, a group of people that are terrified of the other side. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we have a government big enough to do whatever it wants with us. Yeah, and that's what some people want. They want the ability for the government to become stronger, to be able to do things that they want them to do. Right. You know? And it's, and you're absolutely right. That's what I said. Like, it's, I think the most dangerous thing is to allow people to keep it inside of them, to let some of these bad anger, to let these bad ideas like fester. I think Reinhold and needs a lot of people in the Discord, like, they'll say something. It is, I like the Discord channel because it's out underneath a lot of the Zuck thumb. So a lot of people will say some ridiculous stuff. And then you can calmly go like, listen, 
I see how you get that. I see the road that you went down. Let me show you how to walk that back and why you think that. Right. You know, or let's, or please explain that. Why why you think this thing is so absolute that you can't change it. You know, you can't make this work any other way. Just like um, at the, uh, at Triton, we've got two hardcore socials that show up every freaking Friday and we are wearing them down each time. Really? Yeah. No, yeah. that's good. Yeah, no. I mean, and, and and it's kind of weird to watch them. Like, we'll come in and there's like, you know what? I came in hardcore. You know, I still want this socialism stuff like that. And like, we almost got on the path of like, well, you know, like at first, before you try to make this massive like socioeconomic change and change the entire way the government function, can you get socialism to work on a county level, city? Even this, you know, like, you know, like try to get social work on a state level or like, you know, that, you know, that little township level first, find your little township, try to get social work there before trying to expand it out to the entire, uh, you know, if it's such a great system. So all of that, just try to work it out. Look, out new, look up new harmony. See how that worked out. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, okay, so if you can't make it work here, so you're going to get more money and that's going to make it work better. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Then why did it, why couldn't it fail? What make them the county? The county's got plenty of money. I swear to God, I'm going to burn your chair. <laughs> that rap, rap, rap. Oh, that must be annoying the hell out of some listener right now because it's annoying the hell out of me. <laughs> Sorry, I I have a chair on uh, my wish list. I'm waiting for somebody to just purchase it for me by somebody. I mean, my wife. <laughs> uh, still, still the ones from work, dude. <laughs> 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 uh, you probably could. I'm not gonna lie. Like, no one's gonna miss it. I would never do that. I would be on record that I would never take anything from work. Okay. All right. Ja- what? What is James smoking? There's a new. There's a new person in the Zoom. It says James. Are you outside now? Yeah, because like Heather's like you're loud. I'm like yeah. What up? So I'm like I'll go home <laughs> much. All right, well, let's start wrapping this up. Let's give our final thoughts. James, let's ha- have you go first. Go ahead. No, but like, like I've said this whole time is like, it's just mostly how like people interact with like a, a world that's kind of different, right? With everything kind of being very open, very <laughs> inclusive. With <laughs> This is the least professional podcast of all time. I love it. <laughs> I know, right? But it's, the world's different than it was even like five to 10 years ago. Right. So, Oh fuck. Is that a train? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, I, I think it's just people, the way the world's kind of changed with how like open people are with each other, how people are changing, how men interact with women, how women interact with men, how people interact with communities, state level, uh, government, city level government, even federal governments. It's, they haven't had time to kind of grow into it. It kind of just exploded. Uh, That's partly due to technology, really being able to interconnect so easily. People just weren't ready for that level of like social integration. Um, I mean, fuck people are paying for bath water from like thoughts. I mean, I wouldn't have done that in a million years. Would you, would you buy gamer girl bath water? I'm I mean, the plane. <laughs> all right. So if it's for the show, yes, I bought Super Male Vitality for the show. I'll do anything. For, I spent twenty dollars on stanchions, a, a, a rope belt thing, for an Instagram post. So I'll do anything for the show. You'll do anything for the show. I'm gonna put on my Amazon wish list. Uh, if there's a listener out there who is willing, buy me some Belle Delphine bath water, please. I think it's sold out. Ah. Uh, I won't know the difference. I'm gonna put him on mute. Uh, go- some, yeah, that James knees bathwater. James knees bathwater. Oh God, I'm throwing up in my mouth. All right, Harry, final <laughs> thoughts. Uh, I think. All right, so this podcast I listen to. There's some uh, wall listeners listen to it. Uh, Sovereign Tech, and he was he, and this past, past podcast he was talking about, and it goes on what Nisa is saying is that maybe humanity is not ready for this type of communication. We have it this many thoughts and this many people coming and talk to each other, just like how humanity was really ready, like in the uh, Roman period, was ready for indoor plumbing. They used lead piping in their and in, in, uh, in their plumbing. That indoor plumbing was great. You could have water anywhere in the house. But the pipes were lead. I mean, it's poisoning their brains. Same way with maybe the social media and the way all the stuff is poisoning ourselves. 
but we don't see that. We want the facade, the keeping up the Joneses of keeping on with all this internet connectivity and social media. But you know, in home reality, it's poisoning ourselves. You know? Harry, you're the most depressing motherfucker I've ever met on. <laughs> <laughs> like James, when when you're walking around at work, like does does everybody just go, "Fuck Harry, shut up"? I gotta. Like, do they do that? Yeah, like they're just like, "Oh my god, Harry, please, you're so depressing." Harry's not depressing. Like Harry, does, Harry's like try hard. <laughs> so that's, that's funny. <laughs> In what way? You no, know, like like when I was talking to you about faces, right? So like. Like Harry at work is like he try he just try hard shit. <laughs> he's like, like he'll come in like one day or I think someone tells him something. And he's like, like uh, you need to improve on something, right? So like someone tells him he needs to improve on something. So he'll come in like the next day and just like try hard. Like hey, this is what you need to get done today. I'm like, all right, we'll, we'll do it. So <laughs> why does James look like a possum up close? <laughs> you really should go see the video at the end on YouTube. James just has the camera like super up close and he just looks like a possum the way that he was smiling. Oh yeah. He did, mm. yeah. Yeah. James, you said you're Asian? You have Asian in your blood? Yeah, a little bit. Fascinating. I've known you for like ten years. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. All right. Nice, no. thanks thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Have you seen my uh fuck? Oh, never mind. The fucking phone's gonna die. But no, it's, I was gonna show you like my my slugs. Like I have slugs out here, and like I have this massive fucking slug. Show us. Let's see. Oh, Great fuck. radio. Why not? Do it. All right. These are my boys. This is like Thor. And these are like Thor's like bastard offspring, right? This is what we do now. <laughs> I think I, I all right, bye James. All right, later. <laughs> oh my god, Harry. This He's something cool. else. Yep. I know. I, and the thing is it's like I love James. He's awesome. He's amazing to work with. Um he is that person you need at your job to, you know to help to help kick things through. You know, I yeah. I enjoy it. You know, the, but yeah, it's, sorry, that's the, the note I'm going to end on. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just, it's a lot of it's just poison. Some people are just ready for it. Now there's some of us that were born into this in the nineties and we just kind of found it interesting, but we still had that, you know, but the connection was slow when we went out and saw different people. Some people, this, you know, this connection is all they need. It's that's everything right. in life is about moderation. Right. Except listening to Weird Libertarians. There is there can be none. Right. Binge watch us, <laughs> listen to old episodes, sit in your hot tub and just keep listening. That's right. Uh all right. I want to thank our patrons here at the end. Craig DaCosta, Christy Avery, uh, the Libertarian Coalition. Go like their Facebook page. Jason Doolittle, Jeff Bennett, and Ed Brehob. Thank you guys for being one hundred dollar a month patrons. We really do appreciate your patronage. And uh the first of the month is coming up. If you sign up today, it won't run your card till the first. Uh, and it really, really, really helps. So we got a bunch of big projects that I've got in the pipeline that I want to do, and it all benefits creating new libertarians, and it all depends on how much capital I have. So if you want to create new libertarians, supporting real libertarians is the best way to do it. Uh, with that, we want to thank you for joining us here on this show, and we will see you. Uh, I will be back on Saturday with the Chris Bangle Show. Uh, we're going to be talking about the economy. And uh, I apologize, I did not get a show prep this last Saturday. Harry, it's all a work in progress. We're spinning it up slowly. Um, I sat down to kind of have this conversation. Mm-hmm. And I, rec- I recorded like five minutes of the show about this very conversation that we had. And I said to myself, I don't, I want to have, just let's talk to James. Why would I talk about my conversation with James when I could talk to James? So uh, the, uh, so I had nothing else prepared and I wasn't going to waste your time. So that's what happened Saturday. Uh, so I'll be back Saturday next, uh, next week. I'll be back here with Harry. We are tentatively talking about, uh, policing in America and what's happening in an update five years after Ferguson. So unless something in the, in the 
world of news changes, that's what we'll be back uh, talking about on 366. So stay tuned. Harry, thanks for being here. And uh, thank you, listener. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay.